Well, welcome everybody to our BCUG graphics workshop for the February 16th, 2023 session. And in just a moment, we'll do a little screen sharing. Nope, that's not what I want. Here we are. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, so we've got it official. And today, according to what I checked last night for the weather report, February 16th, today, Thursday, we were supposed to hit a high of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Didn't feel like February 16th, did it, folks? Well, no. certainly, certainly feels like spring is in the air. And for those of you who are already getting spring fever, uh, you might have started to count down, as I have. We have 30 more, 32 more days till March 20th. What's special about March 20th? First day of My spring. wife's birthday. Whose birthday? My wife. Well, I hope you have something nice planned. Of course. Tell her I said hi and happy birthday at the appropriate time. Now, if you go outside and check and look down on the ground, you might see that daffodils are already up in my yard. I got them. some of them are this big already with the buds, flower buds, getting ready for a little more nice warm days that shouldn't be here yet. And not only are the daffodils up, but hyacinths are breaking through the ground, just showing a little bit of a green tip. And even tulips have broken through with some foliage about this high. So spring is definitely in the air when it shouldn't be. Kind of scary. It's been a, a very warm winter. Anybody remember seeing any snow? Well, we have some, had some. Yeah, there was a little bit, but it disappeared uh, yeah. quickly. Yesterday was snowing in Las Vegas, according to my sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. There's a big dip in the jet stream. So cold air is coming, was coming all the way down into the south, even down to Texas. And then the jet stream looped up, bringing up warm air, and that's what we're getting. At least that's what the weatherman said yesterday. Anyway, spring fever, moving up, spring fever. I always have to tell you about orchid stuff because I am an orchid grower. And this is something great for you to enjoy at the NYBG. NYBG. What is the NYBG? Maybe Howie Goldberg could tell us. Howard? Uh, he's only just connecting. Well, hi, Howard. I see the top of your head, Howard, but no face. Maybe you and Fred can merge together somehow. Anyway, uh, NYBG, the New York Botanic Gardens, across from the Bronx Zoo in the Bronx, will be celebrating its 20th year of having an orchid show. And that orchid show starts February 18th, and it's going to run for about two months, all the way to April 23rd. Back in 2014, I went with my trusty 3D camera, took loads of pictures, and put together a six-minute show based on the orchid show which I'd be happy to show you if you have an interest.
Hello, ladies. What's with the orchids? Well, we started collecting after we started coming to the orchid show here. And uh, we've had lots of fun going to antique shops and shows and finding more and more. The two of you together? Yes, we go as a fr friends and we go to a show. One day after the antique show, uh, or orchid show, we went to a show. We saw an orchid pin and we said, oh, we should buy that and wear it to the next orchid show. Well, you look great. Can we <laughs> see Can we see your, your hand with it. the beautiful orchid? Oh, I'll put your... Uh, yeah, oh, mine is very inconsequential in comparison, but... <laughs> ah, beautiful. Thank mine, you so much, you ladies. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. How many so other people lovely. have stopped you? Um, about three. <laughs> three. I'll be, I'm sure there'll be many more. In fact, we had the gentleman that, that plans this show stop us the minute we walked in here. <laughs> Hi there, folks. Walking my way through <laughs> in 3D. Oh, hello everybody. Is that all you have to say? Uh, if you are interested in seeing it, uh, if you just go to YouTube and do a search for my posting site, you'll find it. My posting site is Mr. That's M R lowercase Mr. M R W H S sixty seven M R W H S sixty seven, and just look for the Orchid Show. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my screen now? Yep. Yeah, I do. Next, next thing I wanted to show, share with you is the Philadelphia Flower Show. This is will be the first time in two years that it will be back at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. And it's, it's really a great way to start the spring. This has been running since 1829, and so he's about the first week in March. Well worth checking out. Next, last time we were together, last month we were talking about Avatar. I was pointing out that you can see it in 2D, 3D, IMAX, uh, 
Dolby. And then I, I came up with 4DX. Does anyone know what 4DX is? I, Incredible. I didn't know what it is either. But I was able to find a video on YouTube, which I have dutifully copied, and I will share with you. So you will know what to expect if you go to see Avatar or something else in 4DX. And I hope to do this within a week because it's still playing in 4DX. It's got to be in a special 4DX theater, though. Now, one thing uh, I find on my computer is to get a recorded video to play. It takes a little while for it to figure out what to do. But here we go. You should be able to hear the sound on this because it's right off my computer. If you have never seen a movie in 4DX, then I would highly recommend you watch Avatar The Way of Water in 4DX format. Avatar Theory here, hope you're doing well and having a fantastic day. And earlier today, I watched The Way of Water in 4DX format. And I can honestly say that I really enjoyed it. And it felt like a joyride through Pandora from beginning to end. If you want to know my thoughts on the movie itself, the characters and the story, then look at my spoiler free review on my channel as this video will purely focus on the 4DX format of The Way of Water. The experience on watching this movie in 4DX was unlike any other that I've experienced and I've honestly never felt the seat being this intense as it did in The Way of Water. During big action set pieces and especially during Banshee flight scenes, it really made me feel like I was right there in the middle of everything. The movie was in 3D as well as in high frame rates and you during my initial review, I did state that sometimes the high frame rate took me out of the experience, but I do feel that it worked for the 4DX format. Sometimes during big action scenes, it almost felt like I was going to fall off my seat. And funny enough, the person next to me put their popcorn on their knees and I kept thinking to myself that it's going to fall off. Funny enough, during the action scene where the Navi attacks the RDA trains, which happens fairly early on in the movie without going into any spoilers, I saw popcorn all over the floor and the person next to me had nothing to snack on for the rest of the movie. It goes without saying, but don't have an open beverage while watching a movie in 4DX and don't keep your snacks loose on your legs as it will fall off, especially in this movie. The scent through the movie was fairly in line with what was happening on screen, so when they were in the jungle, you had had sort of a jungle or plant-like smell, and when they were in the water or near the ocean, there was a fresh scent going around, and the water splashes wasn't as much as I expected, as I was a little bit concerned given the fact that temperatures were hitting negative 15 degrees outside. With scenes that had rain in it, there were light raindrops or light water drops from the top, and most of the scenes containing the ocean, such as Pyagan splashing or the Navi riding Ibus, has light water splashes from the front. It wasn't intense, so there wasn't one moment where I needed to take off my glasses and wipe it down. As I felt it was just the perfect amount. The scenes where Loak was training with an Ewu and Jake training with the Skin Ring was probably the most intense scenes with the seats moving, as it really made me feel like I was right there with Jake on the skin wing, or right next to Loak trying to tame an Ewu. I didn't really feel much going on around my feet, and the punches in the lower back or the lower part of the seat felt like a light massage at times, as I think if it would have been any harder, it would probably have hurt my back. The one annoying thing or distraction that occurred was each time smoke appeared. I feel the smoke pushed out in the front of the cinema was a little bit too thick and it caused the movie or projector in this case to have the movie display on the smoke that caused a clear shadow mark on the screen. It was only a few seconds at a time when it does happen but it was a distraction nonetheless. Oddly enough, despite advertising clearly stating that there will be flashing lights during certain scenes, that did not happen at all. I know this specific cinema that I watched this movie in is capable of the flashing lights because when I was there watching Avatar Remastered in 4DX, it did have flashing lights during certain scenes, so I don't really know why it was absent during the way of water, but I was honestly fine with it because I felt that the flashing lights was a huge distraction during Avatar Remastered. I have had 
a couple of 4DX experiences in the past at theme parks, and as for movies, I've seen Star Wars Episode 7 as well as Avatar Remastered in 4DX, so The Way of Water would be my third time experiencing it in the cinemas. It is by far the best 4DX experience that I've ever had, and certainly the most intense, so if you have any severe injury, especially in the lower back, or if you struggle with back pain, then I would certainly recommend that you do not see this movie in 4DX format. Did this take me out of the experience? I wouldn't say so, no, but then again, this is my third time seeing Avatar The Way of Water, so I knew what to expect when going into this movie, thus it is a little hard to say if it distracted me from the story. One thing that I really liked about 4DX in this movie is when characters are relaxing on the water, there are slow subtle movements of the seats going up and down as the ocean moves up and down and that honestly felt really relaxing. Also when there were intense moments on screen, as I said you really feel it in the seats, but when there were quiet, calm and serious moments on screen, mostly dialogue related, I really took in those quiet moments more than what I did when I watched it in IMAX formats as it felt like it gave me a moment to breathe and really appreciate the scene. But I guess that is the whole point of watching a movie in 4DX. The screen is much smaller though, at least at the cinema that I was watching at, so of course I would still recommend you watch it in IMAX format if you want the best picture, the biggest screen, and the loudest audio, but if you want an experience that is unlike any other, an experience that really pulls you into Pandora, then you can't go wrong by watching Avatar The Way of Water in 4DX format. Just make sure you hold onto your popcorn and make use of those quiet moments to take a sip of your soda, as the running time of over 3 hours can be a downside if you struggle to watch anything in 4DX. But if you have watched Avatar The Way of Water in 4DX or any other movie in 4DX, let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below, and for more Avatar content, have a look at the rest of my channel. Until next time, have a fantastic day, and stay safe. Okay, is everybody there? Yep. So, what do you think about 4DX? My wife would never go. <laughs> she, has, uh, she has problems with motion. And yeah, this was not for her. The, yeah, they do say if you have a bad back, don't go. And I would think if you're pregnant and in the ninth month, it probably would not also be a good idea. Has anyone ever been in a 4DX kind of experience? Yeah, they, at uh, a Great Adventure, they had a, a jet plane, military plane experience where it flew you through canyons and all over places like that so that the plane was turning and everything. and the seats vibrated and moved and stuff like that, but it didn't have air blowing in you. Obviously, if you were in a jet plane, you would not have air blowing in your face. Unless you open up the water. windows. Unless you open the windows for a little fresh air. Not a good <laughs> idea, though. I don't. I don't think that this appeals to me too much. I was just reading about. Uh, in uh, the Economist magazine, there was an article. They were trying to build uh, sensory suits that you would wear this suit and it would have, uh, they had different mechanisms for making you feel things. They could give you little electric shocks or uh, have pneumatic plungers, hundreds of them all over your body. And so that when you reached out to touch something, you actually had a feeling in your fingers. They would have gloves that would have senses. And when you reached a certain point, you would have a feeling of pressure on your fingers. Now, that is, uh, that's more interesting, but they weren't trying to also squirt water in your face or blow air in your face or anything like that. But, but they are working on, um, artificial uh, augmented reality like that yeah virtual reality 
I think they're finally uh, introducing smell into the uh, videos now in the theaters. Yeah, well, that's part of what they were talking about here for this 4DX. Uh, and uh, the closest I ever came was being in Disney World in Florida at Avatar Land or Pandora where I actually got into a theater where they had movable seats like what we saw in this video. And they duplicated what it would feel like to be on the back of a banshee flying up and down and around, navigating through waterfalls and such. And the screen was in 3D. You had to wear 3D glasses. And it was the most realistic experience. It was phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to at CES, the consumer uh, uh, show in Las Vegas, uh -huh. uh, it's old stuff, but I, but they're pushing now um, a three three D TVs without the glasses. Yeah, auto stereoscopic. That's something that showed up a few years ago when three D was popular when Avatar first came out. Uh, they, I, I ha actually have a video about it. It was for a eight K. 3D auto stereoscopic TV. I have enough problems with my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't. I can't take the red green glasses at all. Uh, too bad. It's a great experience. Well, the great experience for me as a kid growing up was the uh, stereoscopic viewers. Mm -hmm. um, I still have a couple. They're, they're to me the best. It's really realistic looking through something close up um, and by using both eyes and not depending on the, the glasses and looking at a distance. When it's close up, now for me, it, it's better if it's close up. If, if you look at a distance, uh, it would be difficult for me. It might be better for someone else though. I don't know. Well, I thought that it was very it was cool. It was interesting to see Avatar, uh, the way of water in IMAX 3D. I thought it was worth it. You get a senior discount and I had some coupons. And so it was not even more expensive to watch it that way. But it was really, really very immersive to see it like that and very realistic 3D. It was terrific. Hey, no, I asked, weeks, I asked, uh, what, what, what is the story, what is the story about? Because wasn't there another movie a while back? Which yeah, this is the second something? one. Oh, okay, yeah. they already have they already have the third, fourth, and fifth. Oh, the shape, uh, Bill. Didn't you tell us that they already had the third, fourth, and fifth third one is finished in production? And will be yeah, uh, Avatar three is finished. It's going to be about the Navi, the Ash people. A S H, I guess they live near a volcano. Uh, so that's finished. That's going to be released at the end of this year in December 2023. Avatar 4 is in the works, and Avatar 5 they'll be working on, but I don't think they're working on it yet. But they have the storyline where the Navi, some of them are going to come back and visit the earth and see what's going on here and get a better understanding of why the Earthlings have come over to Pandora. Anyway, uh, did you mention something about this kind of viewer? Yes, indeed. Yeah, Viewmaster. Right? Viewmaster, yeah, Kodak, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you have a whole collection of these reels? I don't have a whole collection. Um, and there's, of course, nothing like uh, you know, a lot. A lot of the uh, uh, slides that I had were of the West, uh, Colorado. Uh -huh. Nothing like going out there in Colorado and actually viewing the mountains in in real time. <laughs> in real time, and they they say about uh, just uh, just aside the the Western mountains are remote, they're far away. The Eastern Mountains, which I've also enjoyed uh, down in Shenandoah Valley, they're close up, you can touch and feel them, but the uh, the Western Mountains are, 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 are 
or distance, but nevertheless, nothing like being there in person. Nothing. Except the 3D experience. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you that, that this the title here, The Way of Water, there was a movie uh, not too long ago called The Shape of Water. Yeah. Has nothing, I, to do, nothing to do with that. Un, unrelated. Unrelated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Uh, here's something interesting that I discovered. Uh, when I was in college, I had a friend by the name of Jerry Goldstein. And I haven't seen Jerry Goldstein for years and years and years. And all my college buddies and I, uh, who are still friends, every time we get together, we say, what am I having Jerry Goldstein? So I tried to find this guy, and I came across this. So if you are looking for somebody, try going to unmask dot com you might want to write that down unmask can you put can you put that in the chat uh yeah you know this is well, this is a place this is a place bill where uh if you go back to the presentation that we had about qr codes by john kraut uh-huh yeah i'm starting to put qr codes next to this because people can't copy down something like this YouTube thing unless you leave it on there for a long time. Right. But if you put a QR code for the link, then somebody can take their smartphone and just take a picture of it. Right. Yeah, well, what I, got did, it. what I did last month is, and the month before that, uh, I issued an abbreviated form with all the links that I used during my presentation. So that, that should work. If so, if you post the video, somebody can always pause the video and copy it down. Yeah, actually, but, you know, uh, I hit the uh, record button, but I'm not even sure. Yeah, if I, you know, who, it's, who's recording. it's recording. It is it recording. Is. Who's going to search? My point has always been, who's going to search through a two-hour, as much as we like it, Bill, who's going to search through a two-hour uh, Bill Silverman video. Just nobody. And Bill Silverman doesn't have the time to spend hours uh, redoing everything to abbreviate it either. When hardly anybody ever bothers looking at these recorded things. Well, they will if you break it down into small chunks, maybe, and yeah. add chapters, maybe. And there are only twenty-four hours in a day. I need twenty-eight as it is. So I agree with you fully, but. There's only so much I can do. I hear you. I know. Yep. Anyway, uh, so that's one thing I want to share with you. Another thing, uh, in, New, in New Jersey, our governor, Murphy, just was on the news today saying by, by 2035, he wants to make it illegal to sell anything other than electric vehicles here in New Jersey. So they're coming. Uh, if you are thinking of getting an electric vehicle, this may be a great time to do it because you could get seven and a half thousand dollars as a tax credit from the federal government. From the state of New Jersey, you could get $4,000. Plus you could also get, I think about $300 for putting a charging unit. Plus if you buy an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid, uh, you uh, don't have to pay tax, sales tax. So that adds up to some big bucks. If you're thinking about getting a car, electric vehicle is the way to go, it seems. So buy, lith buy, buy lithium yeah. stocks and what other precious metals. Fred? Just, just a snide remark, but buy lithium and other precious metal stocks. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's uh, the, the, the hydrogen car, but that's something in development, uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, so this is something where you could check uh, electricforall.org. And again, I will redo all the, my, my whole program outline with the links. But it is electricforall.org rebates incentives. And you can see exactly what's available state by state. Good to know. 
Moving on, uh, if you're interested in art, as I imagine you are if you're at a graphics workshop, uh, here are two great things going on at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, one is an exhibit about Mayan art, and that's going to be there through April 2nd. Uh, bear with me a moment. Do, do, do. I sent this email out to my relatives and friends in my weekly news magazine last week. There was a whole review about this show at the Met. The Lives of the Gods, Divinity in Maya, it should be Mayan art. So if you'd like to spend some time at the Metropolitan Museum, that's the thing to catch. And while there, here's another great exhibit at the Met. It's called Chroma, Ancient Sculpture in Color. You know, a lot of the Greek and Roman statues, those beautiful white marble statues, that's not how they were originally made to be seen. They're actually brightly colored, somewhat like this, which looks a little garish. But that's the sort of thing they did. Most of that pigment, of course, has been worn away, but there are remnants of it. And if you go to the Metropolitan Museum, you catch this exhibit all about that. Now, why are we here tonight? The basic idea was photogrammetry. And last month, we spoke about what it is, what it's used for, how it's done. And I had spent hours upon hours and hours and hours downloading YouTube videos and trimming them and organizing them. I had about 13. I broke it down to about eight or so edited them, and we only got up to number three in the sequence. So I have the rest of these things to show you if you're interested. And I assume you are, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. So a quick review, what is photogrammetry? And basically, we have this definition, the science of making measurements from photographs. And there are some amazing uses for photogrammetry, some of which we will adventure to look at tonight and maybe continue next month. But photogrammetry is used in making maps, something like Google Earth, if you ever played around with that, uh, surveying architecture in making movies, accident analysis, medical imaging, construction, uh, mining and heavy industry, and virtual reality, and augmented reality, which they did not write down here. Last month, we spoke about some of the software for photogrammetry. And we mentioned terms like meshwork in the Curie engine, uh, polycam, reality capture. Yeah. And Ralph's experience with one of these that didn't work out too well, the 3DM Zephyr, how it's done. Uh, tips. And this is taken basically from a video that I, I think I showed you, but there was some question about some things there. So we're going to go back to that and pick up from there. Uh, we also took a look, about, look at how photogrammetry works in terms of the mathematics where all sorts of little triangles are generated, which when put together in a massive computer effort, enables you to generate a 3D image that you could rotate and look at from different angles and looking at it closer. Uh, STL, STL, the standard triangle language or standard tessellation language. Ralph, you're a math teacher. What does tessellation refer to? Now, Ralph's on the phone. I guess he's ordering supper. Tessellation, 
tessellating is like tiles, mosaic tiles. You break it up into little tiles. So a mosaic, a Greek mosaic, uh -huh. would be tessellated. So here this guy's nose is tessellated. Yeah. So if you made if you if you made little tiles out of each in the shape of each one of those pieces, you could stick it together and it would cover his actual face. Mm -hmm. And that's how the face is reconstructed, reconstructed from the huge number of photographs that you would take if you wanted to get a good 3D image that you could rotate and play with. Now, there's another technique which we mentioned but didn't really go into, something called NERF, N-E for neural, R radiance, F field. We'll take a look at urban photogrammetry, where photogrammetric images are, are taken for landscape features and building features. And there'll be some discussion of LIDAR. LIDAR, you might have heard of it, stands for light detection and ranging. As a matter of fact, I think Teslas were using LIDAR in their in their software to help guide the car as you're driving along without you doing the actual driving. Uh, and I also think they stopped using LIDAR last year or the year before. Okay, so I am going to go back now to last month where I had my edited videos. And this one, uh, 2B, photogrammetry, how it is done. I think it makes sense to take a quick look at this again. Photogrammetry or 3D scanning with smartphone apps often produce undesirable results. But the five following techniques will help you get detailed and accurate 3D scans with any iPhone or Android phone. The most important consideration is your lighting. Avoid hard shadows at all costs. I recommend finding a place away from any windows as sunlight will change while you snap the photos. For best results, use a windowless room or hallway. Use some LEDs to light up the entire object. A softbox or other photography lights will be helpful. The cheaper alternative is to find a recessed light in your hallway, then locate the object directly under it. Overhead lighting will help minimize the hard shadows from being cast in a single direction. Before you start the 3D scan, find something to prop your object above your table surface, such as a toilet paper roll. This TP roll will make cleaning up the final scan much easier as the surface will have less contact with the bottom of the model. Propping the model also helps reduce unwarranted shadows. Consider the surface of the object itself before you start the 3D scan. Anything with metallic or reflective surfaces will need to be spray painted or covered by another material. If you have issues with solid white or other light or solid surfaces, you can take a piece of sidewalk chalk and rub it over the object. The additional color will give the photos more detailed reference, resulting in a highly detailed scan. I recommend using the new Curie Engine app, as they offer free 3D scanning on both iPhone and Android. Unlike most smartphone 3D scanning apps, Curie Engine processes each 3D scan using cloud computing. Cloud computing gives you more details and better results than what your phone could process and also means you can start additional 3D scans while they're processing. This is the only smartphone photogrammetry app that has consistently produced better results than LiDAR 3D scanning with my iPad. To start scanning, select the plus symbol and take photos. It's critical to keep the object sitting perfectly still. Snap the first photo, then move 20 to 30 degrees over and snap another. It's always best to have a significant overlap with your photos versus no overlap. Otherwise, your final 3D scan will have large holes that you can't repair. Using a turntable is generally not recommended with smartphone-based photogrammetry, as the elements in your background are what help the app stitch photos together at the correct scale. You should also avoid using a solid backdrop. Try to take photos close. John, did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I was talking about. The, the background is fixed. 
the object is fixed. The only thing that's doing the moving is you and your camera. Hmm. Okay. To the model to capture more details, but keep in mind that some background items should always remain in each photo. Most importantly, be sure to take photos in different layers. After going all the way around the object, do the same thing at a higher and lower level. For the best 3D scan results, you'll want to take 50 to 200 photos, depending on the object and the amount of detail you're trying to capture. So, John, are you going to try this? Yeah, I'm going to try it. Uh, that 200 photos is, the, you know, it's like, that's a lot. The more, the better the results are going to be, though. Right? Yeah. Hey, I can start with 50, as he said, something simpler. And uh, the Kiri engine is free. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at what I call video 4A. It's about the software called Polycam. And you can do this with your iPhone, which is what you have, right, John? I have an iPhone. What was your question? Uh, is it an iPhone that you have? Yeah. Okay, so... This is something that you might want to check In out. In this video, we're going to be talking about Polycam. Polycam is an iOS app that allows you to create 3D models from an object from photos. So in this video, we're going to be taking this dog, taking some pictures of it, and then generating a 3D model. You ready? Let's dive in. Polycam was originally created as a LiDAR scanning app but since expanded to include a photogrammetry mode that they call photo mode that's compatible with most modern iPhones. So before we talk about Polycam, let's take a step back and ask ourselves, is Polycam a good fit for me? So take a look at the statements on the left and the statements on the right. If you're somebody who's looking for sub-millimeter precision and advanced mesh editing capabilities and you want it to be free, Polycam's probably not going to be a great fit. However, if you want a simple and easy to use app on your phone that doesn't require any mesh editing and can produce watertight meshes with a colored texture and you're comfortable paying under $10 a month for 100 scans, then Polycam is probably going to be a good fit for you. If you're interested in an app that gives you more control over the scanning process, you can check out some of my videos on Metashape in the description below. It's a more powerful program, but it's more expensive and it has a much steeper learning curve. So let's get started with Polycam. You don't really need a whole lot of equipment to use Polycam. Here, I'm going to be using a turntable just to make it a little bit easier to move the model around, and I'm also going to be using a tripod that I can mount my phone to. This is just so the phone doesn't shake or jitter when I take a picture, and to keep the images nice and steady. I'm using an iPhone 13 Pro Max, but pretty much any iPhone will work with this app whether or not it has LiDAR. With our model on the turntable and our phone on the tripod, we can start to get things set up for our scan. One of the first things that I like to do is to put the model onto the turntable and rotate it a couple of times so I can see through the phone whether or not the object will stay in frame during the entire rotation. If you see one part of the object sticks off camera a little bit, go ahead, move it, and try again. So, so John, it seems that whether or not you use a turntable or not depends upon which software you're going to be using. Yeah. We're going to see how this one works. Yeah. With everything My phone doesn't have LiDAR. The Eureka's does. Uh-huh. We can start taking some pictures. I use a pretty steady process. I just take a picture, turn a little bit, take another picture, turn a little bit more, and I try to keep everything as steady as possible. Once I've made a full resolution around the model, I'm going to go ahead and place it on its side. This lets me capture some of the detail under the legs, under the chin, and kind of around the spots that are a little bit harder to see dead on. Once I've captured this full side, I'm going to flip the model over and repeat the process again. This just lets us get the maximum coverage possible. And really, the more photos you have, the better the mesh is going to look and the better the texture is going to look too. You'll notice there's a pretty harsh standing shadow here. I did my best with the lighting, but it's something I'm not particularly good at. So the less shadows you can have, obviously, the better your scan is going to come out. So from here, we can go ahead and upload the files. And before we do anything else, 
one of the things that I like to do is scroll through all the photos that I took and just quickly make sure there aren't any blurry photos or any photos that are out of focus that might cause the algorithm to skip a beat. Anything that looks like it's going to be a problem, we're just going to go ahead and delete. This all looks great to me. So at this point, I feel pretty confident that all these photos look good. So now we're able to move to the next step, which is processing them. We've got a couple of options for processing the model, but the most important one for us is to make sure we select Use Object Masking. This will cut the model out from the background and from the turntable and just makes it easier to process. For the level of detail, we have a few options. We have Reduced, Medium, and Full. Basically, all that we're doing here is determining what is the size of the texture? How much detail is this texture going to have? What is this model going to look like? So for this scan, we're just going to go ahead and select Medium and click Go. And that's it. About two minutes later, our 3D model is completely finished and ready for us to inspect. The texture looks pretty good. You can see there's a couple areas here on the mesh where it had a hard time with the spikes, and it kind of stitched them all together into one big spike. It's not the end of the world. The mesh itself looks pretty good, and the texture looks fantastic. You can even see some of this writing on the belly of the dog. So it's pretty impressive stuff, considering this took only a couple of minutes to make. You pretty much watched it happen in real time. So from here, the last step of our process is to upload and share our model. I'm going to upload and share it to Sketchfab. I'm a big fan of Sketchfab. It's an easy way to upload models and share them, especially because it has an in-browser viewer. From the Sketchfab web interface, we can also take a look at the mesh of the model. So we can see here the texture has been applied, so we're looking at the model in full color. But we can also pull that texture away and just look at the raw mesh underneath. So if we were planning to use this model for 3D printing, this would be the mesh that we'd be printing. So it does have some minor issues, but generally speaking, considering it took under five minutes to make, I would say this is definitely a success. We can also take a look at the wireframe of the mesh and see that it's pretty clean. It doesn't really have any high concentration or excess density. So overall, Polycam is a great app, and I think it's a great way to carry a scanner around in your pocket and use it to scan things out in the wild. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please let me know if this is an app that you've used before or if there's an alternative that you prefer. As always, thanks for watching and have fun printing. Okay, is everybody still with me? Here. Yep. 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 Okay, now imagine that you were trying to do this not with an inanimate object on a turntable where the object of course stayed still and you could flip it over from one side to another side as you were rotating it uh what would happen if you try to do that with your wife <laughs> <laughs> or uh or a bird or a dog might be tricky well that's something we're gonna have to consider uh next let's see what i have next for you uh, 4B. Now we're going to take a look at some, uh, another look at Polycam. Orogrammetry and 3D scanning in general have been a hot topic in the last few years. Once it was a niche process only for big budget movies and games, and it is now cheaper and more accessible than ever. You can use it to scan your environments, yourself, or any object you want and turn it into a 3D model in a span of just a few minutes. In the last few years, the technology in the 3D scanning department has come a long way since its inception. In today's video, of course, we're going to talk about 3D scanning and photogrammetry, and we will try to demystify some of its concepts and see some methods that you can use to capture your environment using only your smartphone. Before we dive deeper into the topic, we're going to talk about Polycam, who are kind enough to sponsor this video. It is a powerful app that will allow you to easily perform 3D scans for anything you want. You can edit and process your scans directly in your phone and either export them to any of the numerous formats it offers or share it directly to Sketchfab, for example. The LiDAR model also comes with a lot of extremely powerful features, such as turning your scan to a top-down floor plan or extending the scan where you can literally continue the scanning where you left off to expand the scan area. And you can even crop out the unwanted areas in the scan right from the app. Just to name a few things you can do. The Pro version also supports the ability to export a plethora of different formats, such as FBX, OBJ, DAE, GLTF, and more. 
Only cam has two modes, photo mode and lighter mode. To use the lighter mode, you're gonna need an iPhone or an iPad device with a LiDAR scanner on the back, but you can also take advantage of the photo mode, which doesn't require a LiDAR scanner. However, the app is only available for iOS for now, but the developers are promising an Android version in the near future. The photo mode, on the other hand, while much slower, it requires taking a lot of photos from different angles. It allows you to convert your photos into 3D models using photo scanning algorithms. And for photo mode, you don't need an iPhone or an iPad with a LiDAR scanner. It is great to use for scanning highly detailed objects and scenes overall. If you are interested, you will find the necessary links in the description. All right, now let's start with the basics. 3D scanning is the process of analyzing real world objects, people, or environments to collect the shape and sometimes the color data of things. This data can then be used to generate a 3D model. And it is important to note that the 3D scanning term has underrated all the 3D scanning techniques like laser triangulation, photogrammetry, contact-based 3D scanning, and laser pulse. But today we're going to focus on photogrammetry. The general idea of photogrammetry revolves around generating a fully textured 3D model from a lot of images, sometimes hundreds or thousands of high-quality digital images leveraging a mix of computer vision and powerful computational geometry algorithms. The main advantage of photogrammetry 3D scanning is the ease of use and accessibility, and also the ability to pick up color data and texture data. Another advantage of photogrammetry is the ability to reconstruct subjects at large scales, such as landscapes or monuments photographed from the ground or taking drone shots, or what is called aerial photogrammetry. Conversely, the quality of the result will depend heavily on the resolution of the input images, in addition to the algorithm used to reconstruct the data. Also, depending on the machine you are using, this technique can be quite slow, but it depends on the PC setup and sometimes the algorithm used to read the data. Photogrammetry is, of course, unparalleled in its accuracy, and if done right, the models would be more accurate than any modeling or texturing process because not only all the measurements are accurate, but the color data is also preserved down to the smallest scratches and bumps, especially in close range photogrammetry. Programmetry is used in engineering and architecture, as it relies heavily on accurate measurements when building complex structures, buildings, or anything that requires it to be as accurate as possible. Also, one of the most important industries using photogrammetry heavily for years now is the film industry. One of the first movies that used this technique is The Matrix, and they did that in its famous bullet time sequence. Also, the kitchen scene from The Fight Club. Photogrammetry allows filmmakers more freedom in set design or the planning of complex shots. For example, the Disney's Mandalorian team made use of virtual sets powered by Unreal Engine and a huge library of photo scan assets, models, and environments. Photogrammetry is also being used in video games to create high quality assets and realistic environments, specifically by taking overlapping photographs and deriving measurements from them to create three models and games like Lanoir. In addition to the vanishing of Ethan Carter, Forza Horizon, Battlefield 1, Resident Evil 7, and the recent remake of Resident Evil 2, in addition to a lot more, of course. The thing is, the number of games using photogrammetry has grown massively because of the realism it provides. It is estimated that photogrammetry approach is three to five times faster than modeling from scratch. There are a lot of methods and workflows for scanning your objects and environments, but generally you want a huge library of photos of the subject you want to scan from as many angles as you can, with no hard shadows and no changes in brightness. So try setting your camera and brightness on manual, and once you pick the value or brightness, don't change it. Now, the name of the game is to capture as many images as possible, covering all the angles around your object. Once you do that, you can jump to your PC and use a photogrammetry app or software to construct your 3D model. There are a lot of choices that you can choose from. As a start, you can play around with Polycam, for example, to see how this thing works. Well, here you got an idea of some of the applications of photogrammetry. And one of the most fascinating I found is the use in movies and uh, 
games like what you'd see on uh, Xbox. Okay, now we're going to take a look at video 5A, photogrammetry with Meshroom and Fusion 360. Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time, we're going to check out a photogrammetry application called Meshroom. Photogrammetry turns a series of photographs into a 3D object. So, for example, a few years ago, I used a free photogrammetry application called Autodesk 123D Catch to turn this wooden elephant into this 3D print. However, since that time, 123D Catch has been replaced with an application called Recap Pro that costs $340 a year, which gets us to Meshroom, which is a free open source photogrammetry application. So let's go and take a closer look. Right, here we are on the website for Alice Vision, where we can download Meshroom. Alice Vision is a framework that provides computer vision tools for turning photographs into 3D models, with Meshroom being a photogrammetry application built around Alice Vision. All of this is supported by the Alice Vision Association, which is a nonprofit with the ambition to democratize 3D digitization technologies from photographs. And here, as you can see, users of Meshroom can make a donation to support the work of Alice Vision if they wish. Back on the main website, if we click on Meshroom to download the software, I'm sure you've guessed that, we can scroll down and we will find two download links, one for Windows and one for Linux. Also, as it notes, Meshroom requires an NVIDIA GPU with CUDA support. And here on my test rig, we're running with a 2 gigabyte GT1030. Note that the broader recommended hardware specification is an i7 PC or equivalent with 32 gigabytes of RAM. However, here we're running on a quad core 3 gigahertz AMD A83870K with 16 gigabytes of RAM, on which Meshroom runs with no issues. Finally, on the hardware side, it's worth noting that regardless of what's stated here, it is possible to run Meshroom without an NVIDIA GPU. And to do this, we go across to some of the support pages, but we discover we can do it if we use draft meshing. And if we click on this, you'll find that using this is very well documented, but everything to do with Meshroom is very well documented. But if you do use draft meshing, you'll get lower quality results, and it's not something I've tried out. But I just thought I'd mention this in case you haven't got an NVIDIA GPU. Anyway, let's download the software. So I'll click here on the, the Windows link, because I'm currently on a Windows 10 machine, so I'll do that and save the file, which is 327 megabytes in size. And with the file downloaded, if we go across to the folder in which it's contained, we need to extract the file, so we'll extract there. And with the extraction completed, no more installation is required, because all we have to do is to open up the folder where Mushroom has ended up. There we are, let's just give ourselves a bit more space on the screen. And all we have to do to run the package is to click on the Meshroom exe file, and here we are in this amazing software application. Meshroom is incredibly well designed to incorporate both a high-level and a low-level user interface. Specifically, at the top of the screen, we have the high-level UI, which should allow almost anybody to produce a 3D object from a set of still images. And then at the bottom of the screen, we find the low-level UI, which is node-based and should allow researchers and advanced users to take complete control of the photogrammetry process. And I find all the stuff going on down here very interesting indeed, but in this video, we're going to stick with the high-level interface here at the top of the screen. And of course, you want some demonstrations. I'm going to do two in this video. And I thought I'd start out by creating a 3D model of the wooden elephant, like the one I previously generated in Autodesk 123D Catch. 
To this, I still have the set of 36 images that I took as I rotated around the object to photograph it from all possible angles. So, to start the process here in Meshroom, the first thing we need to do is to name our file. So I'm going to do a file, and I'm going to do a save, and we'll go to a folder I've created called Photogrammetry, where you can see I've already got a folder which contains the elephant images, and I'm going to save this project with the name Elephant Test. And it's worth noting that it's very important to keep track of files and folders and their locations when you're working in Meshroom, as output from the program is saved in an auto-generated folder called Meshroom Cache, which will sit alongside your project file. So with our file set up, we'll now load in the images of the elephant. So we'll go across to file and uh, import images. And again, back to photogrammetry, here are the images. And we'll just select all of these and bring them in to the program like this. And uh, here they all are sitting there, elephant photographed from lots of different angles. And all we now have to do to begin the photogrammetry process is to click on Start. And unlike many other photogrammetry applications, Meshroom does all of its processing locally. It doesn't rely on a cloud server. So this is going to take a rather long time. And we can see the progress being made in two places. We can see a progress bar here at the top of the screen. This will take a while to move across. And we can also see down here in this node view, we can see which node is doing something. And again, these will be colored in as things move across. And whilst Meshroom is getting on with its task, it's very important to stress that how well the photogrammetry process will work depends on the quality of the images it's provided with. So just what do you need to do to achieve photogrammetry success? Ah. Well, the ah. first thing is to just use two, two, two spoons and... Henry, Harm, turn off your Henry. Henry, you have to mute him, Bill. Hi, how you doing? I'm here. Okay, yeah. mute yourself, Henry. Thank you motions more, as little noise as possible, and good depth of field so that no part of the target object is out of focus. Lighting and needs to be as diffuse as possible, with minimal shadows and no reflection. In an ideal world, an object will be photographed with lots of identical cameras, all taking a picture at exactly the same point in time, as can happen in a booth like this one I saw at the iMaker store in London. However, most of us have to work with one camera as it rotated around the object. And it's worth stressing that rotating the object itself can be problematic if this changes how different parts of it are lit. Oh, and two final tips. Firstly, make sure you don't change the orientation of your camera, or in other words, shoot everything landscape or everything portrait. And also, don't change the focal length of your lens. Or in other words, shoot every picture on the same zoom setting. Right, back in Meshroom, about 90 minutes has passed and the photogrammetry process has completed, as we can see. And in the 3D viewer, we've now got some data. And if I just zoom in on that a bit, in fact, I'll give us a bit more space on the screen for it, we'll just reorganize. Like mm -hmm. uh, and we can see what we No, he, he sent it. Now. We can see a representation. Bill, of uh, of Bill you can mute happening. Henry. Okay, we got to mute Henry. I'm going to try to mute Henry. Henry, Henry, where are you? I don't even see him here. Well, I guess Henry has disappeared. Henry is muted now. Yeah, okay, we continue. Position for every one of the images. If I click on there, you'll see it actually moves them around. Let's give us a bit more space to see more of those as well. It'll flip between cameras. And we can also zoom in on the elephant, which you can see is sitting in the middle of this. Let's just go in a bit closer on the elephant. There it is. It's upside down. That doesn't, doesn't really matter. We can still cope with that. 
we can change the size of the points on the elephant, the ones that have been created there, as you might see coming up down there. And we can also change the size of the cameras if it makes it easier to see things. And something else we can do here, which is very interesting, is we can click on sync with image selection. If I do that, we see the elephant based upon the image that we've actually got selected over here. So it's showing the point data that's coming from that particular image, which I, I find fascinating. So that's, a, that's just a cool little feature here. Anyway, what we're most interested in, of course, is actually using this model in other applications. And you might be thinking, how do we export this model from Meshroom? And there aren't any export functionality things here in the file menu. And the reason for that is because Meshroom saves all of its output in its cache folder, as I said earlier. So if we go across to the photogrammetry folder, you'll see it's created a Meshroom cache file here. And if we go into that and we go into meshing, you will see we have a very long name folder there. And inside that, we have a mesh object, which here is for the elephant. And if we open this up, it'll open up in the Windows 3D viewer and our F9 to use the whole screen. And here we are, we have the elephant still upside down. And there's a bit of an extra data, a few extra polygons and things around the top. But we can sort this out. We can actually remove these extra polygons and things fairly easily, as I'll show you in the next segment of the video. But just before we do that, it's worth pointing out that here in this video, all I'm going to be looking at is the geometry created by Meshroom, the actual object we're looking at on the screen here without any color on it. But Meshroom has also saved loads and loads of texture data. So if we take a look at that, let's close down that and that and go into texturing in the cache. And again, we found a file for this particular project. And oh, look, there's the texture. We open it up. And this is a PNG file containing all of the textures, all of the color data for the model. And also down here, we've got a textured mesh object. Let's just open up that as well. So if you're interested in having a textured object and working with that, you can create one using mesh room. I'm very impressed with the results. The elephant might still be upside down, but other than that, it's having a fun time here in the Windows 3D viewer. To clean mesh room output, we're going to use a free program called Mesh Mixer, which can be downloaded from meshmixer.com. Mesh Mixer has been an Autodesk product since 2011, although it's no longer in development because a lot of its features are now found in Fusion 360, the flagship product from Autodesk. This said, Mesh Mixer still remains a very handy standalone tool, especially for preparing 3D objects for 3D printing. So let's close down the website. I won't show you a download. I'm sure you can sort that one out. I've got Mesh Mixer installed there, so we'll run it up and maximize the program, and we'll import our output from mesh room, going into that cache again, going into meshing and the project file and open up the elephant like that. And here we can either move around using the mouse in the normal sort of way, or we can use this little cube at the top to move things around as well. And as you can see, the elephants come out pretty well. There are a few problems on the top of the object and under the belly, because inevitably the photographs don't show that bit of detail so well, but certainly things need to be sorted out a bit because for a start, the elephant's on its side. So let's sort out that by going to edit and transform. We've now got some little handles we can pull to turn the elephant around. And that looks pretty good to me, so we'll accept. And the second thing I'm going to do is to do a plane cut, which allows us to cut a plane through the object, well-named tool. Now, if we just drag this down, and to take it down towards the base of the feet, above all the spurious polygons, we'll leave it about there, I think. Again, that, that looks about OK, and we'll accept that. And there we are. We've got a much neater elephant. And later in the video, I'll demonstrate several other mesh mixer tools. But before that, let's go in search of another photogrammetry subject. Guess what? Look what I found. A rather large stone lion. A Chinese guardian lion, no less. And I've got my camera, so I'm going to take lots of pictures of the lion all around it so we can turn it into a 3D object.
And by the magic of filmmaking, here we are in Meshroom, where I've loaded in the 118 pictures of the lion that I took. And I've also run the photogrammetry process, which took about seven hours. I run it overnight. And we've got some output here in the 3D viewer. And as you can probably see, we've got lots of data here. We've got the lion in the middle, but also lots of other things. We've got bits of wall here, all types of stuff. And if we zoom in on the lion like that, you can see it is sitting there. Let's just take the camera size down so we can see it a bit more clearly. We have actually got our final object sitting there. And if we go across to the mesh room cache and we go into meshing and we open up the folder it's created for this project and also the object called mesh obj like that here we have the data we've got to work with and the first time i saw this i went oh dear that's a bit of a mess but do not fear the lion is sitting in the middle of all this if we zoom in there it is and the problem we've had here is one that you often have with photogrammetry if you're photographing an object outside because you get lots of data around the object but isn't the object you want but let's try and get the line a bit closer to us on the screen there we are and as you can see what we do have of the lion is nice and detailed we're a bit close there it's a uh, it's not bad is it the actual model looks looks pretty good so what i now need to do is to take this into mesh mixer and to clean it up in order to extract the lion from the middle of this spurious data greetings here i am back again in autodesk mesh mixer where i've cleaned up the final object as you can see and it's come out pretty well i'm very pleased with it it's not perfect there are issues in particular around the mouth because the photograph didn't reveal detail inside the mouth so inevitably that's a problem with the geometry and there's also a problem on this back leg where there's an internal cavity that i've not actually cleaned up i've spent about two hours to get the model into this state and if we look at the level of detail here let's just bring up the wireframe view you can see We've got a very, very dense mesh, masses and masses of detail in this model. And I think it's very interesting to compare it with one of the photographs of the real stone lion from which the model was derived. It's fantastic, I think, what Mesh Room has achieved with its photogrammetry process. But I'm sure some of you are wondering, Chris, how did you get to this final model from the initial Mesh Room output? So let's go back to that output, which looked like this when I first loaded it into Mesh Mixer. And the first thing I did was to get it aligned with the ground plane using edit and transform. And then I had to start getting rid of all the extra polygons we don't actually need in the model. And to do that, I used select and then selected lasso and drew on the screen to pick up polygons that weren't needed like that and clicked on delete. And after a lot of rotating around and selecting and deleting, I got to this point where there's pretty much only the lion left in the scene. We've got a bit of wall over here, a bit of ground, but I soon got rid of those and ended up with a lion like this. Next, I dealt with scaling by going to edit and transform again, and I set the height of a lion to 105 millimeters. Next, I went to analysis and inspector to try and make sure our object has got a watertight mesh because if you want to 3d print something the geometry has got to be watertight and as you can see there's a lot of issues with the particular object but fortunately in mesh mixer there is an auto repair all option so i just clicked on that which fortunately sorted everything out this said the line has still got a bit of a problem because on the top of its head it's got this strange body of polygons a strange sort of hat on the top of it and this is because the actual stone line that i photographed was over seven feet tall so even lifting my camera above my head i couldn't take good pictures of the top of it so once again what i needed to do was to go to select and to select all of these polygons and to delete them and with that process completed i ended up here with a lion without all the strange polygons on the top of its head but with a hole in the top of its head which needed to be filled in and a hole like this can be filled in in various ways, but I went for the simplest possible solution, which was to go to edit and make solid. And this, as you can see, does fill in the hole if in a rather rudimentary fashion. Although here we've lost a lot of resolution, a lot of detail in the object with the current settings. But we can fix that by changing the settings for make solid. 
And I think I picked something like that and then press the button at the bottom of the screen, which is difficult to see here on my current scanning settings, and I can click it down here. And by Jingo, I now ended up with a far happier lion to which all I needed to do was to go and edit and a plain cut, which gave a nice smooth base, as we can see here in the final object. And so the final thing to do was a little bit of exporting. First, I exported an STL file for 3D printing. And then secondly, an OBJ file, so I could import the Lion into the Lightwave 3D modeling package in which I make all of my 3D animations. And here, I first rendered the Lion with a flat shade just to see what it looks like. And then I gave it a gold shader and rendered out a bit of animation spinning around the model. And I think it's come out very well indeed. Certainly, a lot more time could have been spent cleaning up the top of the model and that internal cavity around the back of the leg. But there's no doubt at all we've proved here that Meshroom is a great piece of software for performing photogrammetry, for making 3D objects from a series of still photographs. <laughs>Guess what? I'm now 3D printing the Guardian Lion. To achieve this, I loaded the STL file that we generated in Mesh Mixer into the Cura slicing software, which in turn produced a G-code file for the 3D printer. Obviously, extruding the Lion into physical reality will take many hours, so we'll now let the printer get on with its task, and here we are with all the support structures removed, we have a final 3D print. And it's really great to hold in my hand an object that I last saw in the physical world as a two and a half ton piece of stone. However, the lion's journey is not quite complete yet, as I'm going to do a little filling and sanding and painting so that we end up with a final model that can guard something of importance on my desk. And I, for one, think this is a great final output from our photogrammetry process. As we've seen in this video, Meshroom is an amazing piece of software that allows us to turn something like this into something like this. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, Please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon. Well, what do you think of that? Pretty impressive. I like the original stone one. Definitely uh, had a lot more detail. But if I couldn't afford the original stone one, I guess uh, this would be one way of getting it. I don't think it's worth the time. He spent a lot of time on all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of money on the 3D printer and all that stuff. By the time he finished, you probably could have bought the original stone one, right? Yeah. Yeah, but, but the, it, think, it's think, interesting think about, to see I that mean, you could do it. The thing is, once you have made one of those, you can make a mold and pop those out a thousand a minute a thousand an hour right in a chinese factory mm -hmm. it's it may take a while to do the first one but now you can reproduce anything whether it's the eiffel tower or that or anything that you can think of somebody is going to be able to do this this is an amazing step forward. It was not even five years ago, I think, that you couldn't get the 3D printing STL file so quickly from a bunch of photographs taken by somebody who's not even a pro. There was, there was somebody found a way to do this very, very quickly in the programming and that's just 
That's amazing. That's just like chat GPT or these other things, except this did not take anything like that. This is all in the one program, knowing how to put 200 pictures together quickly to create the STL file. And now you can get that software for free. Metro was free and the, uh, the Fusion 360. Yeah, but what did he have to do to the computer? What kind of, he had to have something on the computer. It's like, the I don't have that type of stuff. Computing is something in the cloud. He didn't have anything on the computer. He no, he had, had a, a power special enough computer. He had a special type of program on there. Not, not the program, special hardware. No, there was no special hardware on the computer. Why did you think that there was special hardware? It mentions something about you need this on the computer, which I don't have. I don't know what it was, but it was something special on the computer. Uh, no, he installed well, yeah, free, the, the free program Meshroom no, and the no. other free program Mesh Mixer. I'm and, talking about the hardware, not the software. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Well, I thought Bill, I saw did, something that I don't have on my computer. Did anyone else hear that there was some special piece of hardware? Yeah, yeah, there there is special hardware that you can buy, and it could be very expensive. And we'll be taking a look at it, uh, some various various ways of doing it. But you can do it with your just a regular camera and just your smart telephone camera. What I'd like to see, because I have a drone, I'd like to see something done with a drone. Okay, that's what we're up to next. Aerial photogrammetry. You came to the right place. Ralph, for you, I'm ready. Are you the shill, Ralph? I, I, well, we're going to be able to go back and look through this and look through these videos, but I do not believe that you need any special hardware. Okay, here we are, drones for Ralph. Drones are versatile tools that can be used for a wide variety of applications. One of the newer use cases for drones is to help create 3D models, thanks to special software programs that can turn aerial images into digital spatial models. Here's what you need to know about 3D models, how you create 3D models with drones, and how these 3D models are being used across different industries. First, what is a 3D model? It's a three-dimensional representation of an object created by plotting individual points in 3D space along the X, Y, and Z axes. The points are connected by geometric shapes, such as triangles, lines, or curved surfaces, to form the model. You can create a 3D model manually by using 3D modeling software, by using an algorithm, or by scanning a physical object. And this is where drones come in. Drones are essentially airborne scanners that can be used to turn large objects, such as buildings, construction sites, or simply large land areas into 3D models, thanks to a process called photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is the science of making measurements from photographs, particularly aerial photographs. The way photogrammetry works is it looks at photos of a subject taken from two or more locations. It uses the different perspectives of the images along with the location data of where the images were taken to triangulate the locations of points on the subject. The more photos you have of your subject taken from different locations, the more accurate this triangulation process will be. The result is accurate point locations plotted in 3D space, which is exactly what you need to create a 3D model. Drone photos are great for this process because every photo is geotagged. This means the latitude, longitude, and altitude from the drone's GPS and onboard sensors are embedded in the metadata of the image. The metadata also includes information about the camera sensor and the optics of the drone. These geotagged photos can be processed by software programs such as Drone Deploy, Pix4D, and others to create 3D models with high detail and accuracy. To get the best results of creating a 3D model with your drone, you need to do two things. First, you need to make sure there is a 60 to 70% overlap between your aerial photos. This helps the triangulation process be more accurate and track the same points between images. Flight apps such as Drone Deploy and Pix4D Capture allow you to create automated flight paths and set your desired image overlap. The second thing you need to do is make sure you capture photos of your subject at different angles and altitudes. Typically, you want to capture straight down images from around 100 to 200 feet. Then you want to circle your subject at a high altitude 
with about a 30 degree angle. Next, fly at a middle altitude with around a 45 degree angle. And lastly, fly at a lower altitude with a 70 degree angle. You of course also want to adjust your radius to keep the subject in frame. Capturing these different angles and altitudes helps create a higher quality 3D model by providing texture and image data of both the sides of the building and the top of the building. You can then use a software tool to process your images and create your 3D model. You can find more information on creating 3D models with your drone in our article linked in the video description. So how are these detailed 3D models being used across different industries? The construction industry has seen a huge benefit from drone imagery, mapping, and 3D modeling software. Construction firms can monitor progress of their construction sites with regular updates, and they can easily inspect different areas on the site. The accuracy of the 3D models also means they can be used to calculate distance, area, and volume measurements. Land surveying has also seen tremendous benefits from drone technology. Not only has it gotten easier to get an up-to-date view of a landscape, but you can create detailed bare earth models, digital surface models, and true orthomosaics, along with generating 3D models of the terrain. Firms specializing in inspection services can also utilize 3D models and drone mapping technology. They can safely inspect previously unseen angles of properties and equipment more safely and more efficiently. They can spot potential problems with detailed 3D models, add annotations, and see the original imagery for a better look at a particular area. Energy firms benefit from these kinds of tools as well. Much of their equipment is larger, more dangerous, or in challenging to reach locations. The ease of inspecting equipment with drones and 3D models can help make sure inspections happen more frequently, reach more dangerous or challenging to reach locations, and help ensure the safety and longevity of the equipment. The agriculture industry is another area where drones are transforming the landscape. While farmers are not necessarily using 3D models, they can still leverage data from drones to create orthomosaic maps of their fields. Newer drones are available with multispectral cameras, allowing farmers to create normalized difference vegetation indexes for a deeper understanding of their crop health and field performance. Public safety can also utilize 3D models for documenting and recreating crime scenes, recording evidence, and providing a clear picture for investigators, forensics, and jury members. Officials can even gather imagery and data in the wake of natural disasters in areas typically unsafe for people. And finally, architecture and engineering firms are using 3D models to create detailed and realistic context models of their buildings or development projects. These models help architects communicate their final design to key stakeholders and investors. And across all of these industries, drones are making it safer, faster, and more efficient to gather meaningful data while reducing liability and risk. So Ralph, what do you think about that? Quite impressive, you know. And we continue with the use of drones with urban photogrammetry.
Are we missing the sound? We're not hearing anything, Bill. Okay, last thing we're going to take a look at in the sequence is the difference between photogrammetry and NERF. Anybody remember what NERF stands for? Neural. Bill, the last uh, video, we didn't hear any sound. I don't know if you're not aware of that or not. No, I was not aware. It, it was just music in the background i don't know did everyone else have the same problem because i heard the sound no no sound came through that's really on the other hand on the other hand it looked like a presentation very quick presentation of how they did that project yeah so i'm not sure that we missed very much by not hearing it you didn't miss anything except some nice background music Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the difference between photogrammetry and NERF. Well, this is a short one. Last week, I made my very first 3D scan using Polytech. It uses a technology called photogrammetry to generate a 3D model from a series of photos taken at multiple angles. This 3D model can then be used in augmented reality or virtual reality applications. So that's why it was so interesting to me. Recently, a new technology appeared called NERM, Neural Radiance Field. And it made a ton of headlines. It's similar to photogrammetry because it's also a way to visualize a 3D scene or object using image Okay, can you hear the sound on this one, folks? Yeah, but it's poor, Bill. Yeah. I don't know why. Well, it goes we for talk about that yeah. sometime. John? Yeah. John, you have a suggestion? Uh, yeah, but it's too late for that now, Bill. The way to show videos from YouTube is to download them to your computer and then use the advanced sharing technology of Zoom to show the video. Yeah. Showing it from YouTube by putting it, let's not get into this now. We've got what we've got, but I'd like to talk to you about it. Okay, by the way, all the videos that I'm showing you, I have downloaded from YouTube. So I have the MP4 files for them. So if you go and when you go to share, you go up to the, you go, you click on share and then you go up to the right, top right to advanced and then you select a video, share video. And Zoom takes the video and prepares it for sharing. You can do that with this one, and you'll see what the result is. So instead right. of starting this video, I don't see what you're talking about? Can you see my screen? No, I cannot. 
but I can tell you again, stop this video, stop, stop sharing. Okay. And then go to share. Right. And, and look at the upper right where it says advanced. You have an option, advanced. Right, and I don't say anything about... Click on advanced. I did. And then one of the options is video. But I don't have that as an option. Under advanced sharing options, all I have are these three categories. How many participants can share at the same time? Who no, can... you're not looking at the right thing. When you say, I want to share, Ah, okay. Yep. Uh, I see what you're talking about now. Do, 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 do. Computer, audio, or video? Which one should it be? Video. video. And then you're going to select the video. Okay. Now we're going to hit share. And I have to go to that particular file, right? Hmm. Okay, here. hold on a moment, and I will navigate to it. It shouldn't take me too long to find it, hopefully. Okay. And now I'm going to open it. And now if I play it. This has an input. But it differs from photogrammetry a lot. The main difference between these two technologies is that photogrammetry generates a 3D model with meshes and textures. And it's stored in a way. Last week, I made my very first 3D scan using Polycam. Again. It uses a technology called photogrammetry to generate a 3D model from a series of photos taken at multiple angles. This 3D model can then be used in... Were you able to hear it that time? Much better. Yeah. Yeah, yes. no problem. Is, hey, there's, there's Dom. Hi, Dom. How you doing? Okay. Uh, I guess I, I clicked on the file too many times and it started playing twice. So I'm going to go through this again. And let's see if it works. Bear with me, folks. Screen sharing, advanced video, do, 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 share. Last week, I made my very first 3D scan using Polycam. Is that good now? Much better. It uses a technology called photogrammetry to generate a 3D model from a series of photos taken at multiple angles. This 3D model can then be used in augmented reality or virtual reality applications, so that's why it's so interesting to me. Recently, a new technology appeared called NERF, neural radiance fields and it made a ton of headlines it's similar to photogrammetry because it's also a way to visualize a 3d scene or object using images as an input but it differs from photogrammetry a lot the main difference between these two technologies is that photogrammetry generates a 3d model with meshes and textures and it's stored in a way that traditional 3d tools can use it so we can use it in 3D animation, in games, or in VR or AR applications. A nerve generates a radiance field instead of a traditional 3D model. So the way a nerve stores 3D models is very different. Nerve uses machine learning to create this radiance field. With this, you can render new viewpoints of an object from totally new angles. So when moving the 3D model around, it appears to be 3D to your eyes. The radiance field has learned and can guess what an object would look like from any angle 
and renders the image you see on your screen. To give you an example, we use a series of images with a slider to make an object on a website appear three-dimensional. And I remember this super cool slider on the Apple website to see the iPod touch from all kinds of angles. And when twirling around, it almost seems like a 3D model. But if I want to see the iPod from a different angle that was not captured by any of the pictures, I'm out of luck. With neural radiance fields, we can train the machine learning algorithm, and then with the radiance field that is created, we can generate images to see the iPod from totally new perspectives too. I recreated the iPod touch slider at home and I used the images in Luma, and this was the result. Unfortunately, the original iPod slider <laughs> images did not work because there's no background. The nice thing about NERF is that reflections and light effects can be captured very accurately. Water, glass, and shiny surfaces usually don't work well with photogrammetry and the traditional 3D models that it creates. But a downside of NERF is that it's not easily applied in AR or VR applications yet. However, that will improve over time, I'm sure of it, because of better exporting tools and special viewing applications that will probably be developed. For my own experimentation, I used Luma to experiment with NERF, and I used Polycam to experiment with photogrammetry. Well, that's it for my sequence of videos on photogrammetry. Uh, give me a little feedback. I'll take you one by one. Tell me what you think of this topic. And if you want to pursue it, because we're in going to some interesting places. John, what do you think? I am psyched. This is great. I'm going to try it as soon. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try Meshroom. And I'm going to look into nerf more i think that this is really really cool and uh, i'm excited i would love to i i thought that maybe you had found the time to try one of these programs yourself and that you would show us how you did something i was hoping and that i also. and i look forward to having us do that so are you uh, thereby volunteering to take over next month and give us an update on your I can't promise I have so many things on my list right now I fit so, little about, things in just giving us a progress report on any progress that you might have made uh, I'll I'll be in touch with you multiple times during the month okay I probably won't be around. So but. you'll know whether I'm getting anywhere. Okay. But even that. But I did even spend it. money. I bought a turntable. It's so supposed sorry. to come tomorrow. The turntable. Uh, that turntable used to be called a Lazy Susan, right? No, this is a little electrical thing, and it has a remote control, so you can change the direction or the speed as you're going. But mm -hmm. you can turn it on, and it's uh, this one looked like not a bad one from Amazon. It was worth investing in it. You know, once you invest in something, uh, just like when I, I said I'm never going to windsurf if I have to go rent a windsurfer. So I bought a windsurfer, and then I windsurfed because I already had it. I didn't have to wait for anybody else. So making the investment in something at least gets me to spend a little bit more time on it uh -huh. takes away some of the obstacles that sounds Go like on, and uh mickey mickey yeah. got a little feedback from you uh i find it extremely interesting it's not something i'm going to do um although i'm uh, interested in it i think uh some of the earlier thoughts on it lead me to believe believe that it's um, probably something that's uh, the cost is significant enough that you would want to think about some business case. Uh, I think John mentioned earlier 
you know, you, you make one and you knock off a thousand. Um, that's a good plan um, for uh, making money with it. Mm -hmm. Look, Howard Goldberg. How you doing, Howard? Self. Let me unmute myself there. Okay. It's interesting. Will, will I do something like that? Probably not. But I happen to notice a thing. My uh, granddaughter is getting bar mitzvah coming up in March. And they sent uh, uh, a, vid a, a video of uh, bedazzled sneakers that I'll have to show it to you. And I think it has to do with uh, this topic here. So I'll have to send it to you. And see what you think of it. Bedazzled Deacon? Bedazzled sneakers. That's what they call it, the kids. Where they fancy up the sneaker, you know. Oh, and uh, I'll have to send you the photo, and uh, the, uh, the video, and see what you think of it. Yeah, it probably is a, a, a fancy sneaker that's been photogrammetried. So it's a file of the sneaker that can rotate it. And, and right, they rotate it around. Yeah, that's how they do it. So I'll have to send it to you, see what okay. you think of it. Ralph, what do you think? Well, I'm a little bit leery about getting back to it, but I do have something, so John. <laughs> okay, Dom? Yeah, this is my slide. And if you see, it rotates. Uh huh. It goes up and down, and it slides along the slider too. So I can and I can attach my camera to it. But it does go up and down and rotates. And you can set the rotation also. It'll do it automatically, or it'll do it uh, manually. Right now, I'm doing it manually. I have remote more control. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Well, if you try it. Again, let us know how it works out. Okay. That no, looks like a four or five hundred dollar for one. Uh no, it's not that much. How much? No, a couple hundred dollars, maybe. The slide is a couple hundred. I don't know how much this is. Maybe a hundred dollars or so. It wasn't that much. The only disadvantage of that is it goes in a straight line, whereas the one John ordered it rotates. This rotates too. There's two parts to it. There's a top and the slider. The top yeah. part will rotate by itself. I can just set it down. See, I could, I'm right now. I'm rotating it. And well, the thing is, here you're rotating the camera, right? Where the thing that I bought, you put the object on the turntable, and right. you put your camera on a, a uh, on a tripod, and you put your lights above it, and then you rotate the object in front of the camera. Yeah, but I guess I could put the object on the on the thing and then use my tripod, you know, there's a base there's, to it. I can put something on the base. There's pros and cons for each one of those. The disadvantage with John's is it's limited to the size of the turntable. Whereas on routes, he could really do it with any size object, but it's more convenient to do it. Yeah. yeah. And all you have to do with the tripod and the camera is yeah you make a uh, first rotation and you raise the camera uh, and you can uh, keep raising the camera until you get uh, views from above as well. If you, John, if you don't mind me asking you a question on that uh, turntable you bought, what was the price? What was the diameter of the turntable? And what was the weight it could hold? It was $29 plus tax on Amazon. It was the, uh, if you look for, let's see. Uh, I'll get the uh, terminology from my email. I saw those when I, I bought a uh, light tent to photograph objects. I also was concerned in getting a turntable too, but I didn't. Amazon, your Amazon order. Uh, yeah, it's not in this order. It's not, a, it's not in that email. Don't worry about it. I can find it. It's a, it's a turn tent. They have, they're about six inches in diameter and they're designed for display. So it's a rotating turntable. And they have, have lots of them on Amazon. You can, 
They have some very fancy ones, but there's a whole lot of them that are on the, on the, are on the order of $30. Battery this one, Battery or electric? I'm sorry. Oh, this one has three me mechanisms. There's an included rechargeable battery, a USB connection, and uh, so you can connect it to your computer, or uh, another battery. You could connect the USB to a, a, a battery pack. So, so there's three have, ways. Does it have variable speeds? Yes. Variable speeds. Reversible, you can have it go 90 degrees and back, 180 degrees and back, 360 degree continuously. You got, I looked at a few of them, but uh, this one it was easy to pick out. You know, you see the ratings and what people have to say about these things. 30 bucks, it was worth it. You know something? I'm just thinking about that. You could probably get a large size platter, put some type of a ball bearing on it, and by hand rotate it like inch by inch and save yourself some money and get a bigger object. Yes, but then there's the effort. You can rotate it by hand, right? Here, I've got the thing. It rotates. I can start, stop. You can also set your camera up to take a picture every X number of uh, seconds. You can also just take a video and every frame is a picture. You know, there's lots of things. This is a graphics group. There's lots of ways that you can get this. My iPhone does burst mode. It can take, you know, a hundred pictures in a row. You set it up to take a burst mode and you just get a lot of pictures all at once. Press oh, the button so once. You get them. Bill, since I missed most of the meeting, are you going to send a link for the replay? I didn't understand what you said. This is a question for Bill. Yes. Since I missed most of the meeting, are you going to send a replay link? Uh, yeah, it's it's recorded. A list with the, the links for what you missed. And since this did record, I will try to get that on uh, Dropbox. Right. Okay, uh, I, of course I said the same thing last month, but I never had the time to do it. But I will try. John, if you send me the link for what you purchased at Amazon, I'll include that with my links. Okay. Good. Hey folks, it's time to go. It's after nine o'clock. I think uh, it was interesting, very interesting. Where do we go next? Where would you go next with this? Any ideas? Can I add something? You just remind me of something. You know, Michael Brown is a lenticular photographer. And on his website, he posted a link. And he showed where he had a two-dimensional picture. And it was processed with software that made it 3D so that you could actually rotate it and see what was behind the image, which is unreal. Yep. That's what we're talking about. Well, where do we go with this? Let's say you uh, you had your drone and maybe you went to something that looked like the Parthenon. I think there's supposed to be the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I still have something. Uh, uh, okay. And you put together a photogrammetric image, an STL, and then you sent it to a 3D printer. This model was sent to me by a company that does 3D printing. The company, can you read it? Oh, it's backwards. Forms Labs. It's still backwards. It's for Form Labs. Anyway, a number of years ago, they sent me a whole bunch of models that they made 3D printed. So this is one. <laughs> That's another one. Look at the detail on that. Not bad. Yeah. Very good. And next month, our topic is going to be 3D printing. So from photogrammetry, we create the file, send it to a 3D printer. So we'll talk about what 3D printers are. By the way, years ago, you might remember, 
we actually had a meeting all about 3D printing over at the Microsoft store at the Freehold Mall. And I have I don't know whether they still do it, but the Old Bridge Public Library has a maker's room where you can uh, do 3D printing. Oh, really? It's like a public 3D printing facility. They had that once upon a time. You can look it up, Old Bridge Public Library. Do you have to be an Old Bridge uh, resident? I, I do not recall. And even if you did, it might be worth it to pay some amount per year to be a member. Or if you're a member of the, uh, if you have a Monmouth County library card, I don't remember whether Old Bridge is a member. They may be a member of the Monmouth County library system. They're if right on the border. If they are, John, if the Old Bridge library is a member of the Monmouth County system, well, I, I, I know the, the head of the whole system, Judy Tolchin. Yeah. I will ask her if that's a, you know, the case. And if it's not, we'll see if we can get it at the headquarters in Manalpin. Well, they they look up the old bridge library. Yeah, I wrote down my notes. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we go. But then Tim Zebo, Tim Zebo does this stuff as well. I'm surprised that he you see you, you didn't link this to 3D printing. But well, this is a major step ahead in being able to do 3D printing. You remember back when Tim did the, his presentation I about know. the 3D printing back that, back that he did? That was four or five years ago. Yeah. He did it for the graphics workshop. He also did it, I think, at the Trenton State Computer Festival. I saw an interesting uh, short video on home construction using 3D printing. I got it. We're uh, we'll, going over it next month. Do you? Yeah. There's as well as got, body uh, parts and all kinds of layers of stuff. concrete. Pretty fascinating. Now now I'm I'm less interested in doing the 3D printing than in being able to take one of these objects and put it into a uh, a video or put it into use it as part of uh, some other image. Yeah, or rotate it. That, that this leads into the photogrammetry and NERF, uh, but it's particularly photogrammetry is its use in augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, so did you, did one of you guys send me, did one of you? You guys send out this thing about animate your drawing. Did you send that out, Fred? Animate your drawing. Look at the website sketch.metademolabs.com. Sketch M-E-T-A. Yeah, I can put it in the chat. Yeah, but, but let me have that when you send me the link for the Amazon turntable. Okay. I'm putting it in the chat right now. And you can animate a stick figure. But somebody has figured out a few new programming uh, approaches to doing things, which has just moved everything that we can do with computers huge leaps ahead. Well, I think I told you previously that I went to the Van Gogh immersive experience. Yeah. And at the end of the Van Gogh immersive experience for an extra five or $10, you were able to go into a separate room 
where they fitted you with an Oculus Quest 2 headset for virtual reality. And you were able to go into a Van Gogh painting where you had full freedom of vision up and down and around 360 degrees in 3D. You were in the painting. You were able to navigate in the painting and transition from one painting to another painting of his, to another one, to another one for about 10 minutes. And it was extraordinary. I'll go for that and uh, his uh, Starry Night uh, painting. Yeah, yeah, I, I have the Oculus Quest and I have the file for going through Starry Night. Uh, if anyone wants to come over, I'll give you a demonstration. And then I went to the Beyond King Tut immersive experience where they charged me an extra $10, I think, again, with an Oculus Quest headset. And I was inside Tut's tomb in 3D, in 360 degrees, able to go from one chamber into the next chamber, into the next chamber, the next chamber, look around and it was amazing. Mm. And that's all because of photogrammetry, as you saw in the videos here, uh, it could be used to sell real estate where you could go online and go into somebody's house and navigate from room to room and look around. And that's how they generate those kinds of files. Okay. I got to go. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Thanks. Howard, send me that. Good to uh, see you all. Will do. Good to see anybody. Go ahead. Howard, is it Maya who's been bumping? Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Yes. Bye. Henry Hom. Nice seeing you. Hey. Okay. Nice seeing you. Bye bye. Congratulations, Howard. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.